Hello ladies, I hope you're doing well today and that you get a few things done while you listen. I'm Mrs. Sherman. Welcome to Homemaking Radio. I'm broadcasting from the sewing room in the manse from one side. Yesterday I did another side and you can see a little my little thread display in the background and a little bit of my uh, fabric stash. And ladies, today I have a few things to talk about that are not connected to each other but having been a homeschooler we liked to talk about many different things and in some ways they all connect but it's just good to learn about things and to consider things and in fact that's what the word study in the Bible means. Remember the verse, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And this word study meant meant consider, to think about something and to look at it and to sift through it and look at it from different angles. And this is what we'll do later on in this discussion. Thank you very much for coming to visit me at the manse. And I don't have a huge amount of followers or people that comment but that's fine with me I only need a few of you and I am basically doing it for my descendants but until they're ready to listen to it when they're out on their own I thought it might be fun to share it with some of you now I have been listening to what is her name Sally Britton her uh, audiobooks on YouTube and really enjoying them because it gives me something to listen to and I explain to you what some of these audiobooks what they're like and how they are after the Jane Austen style and very decent and for someone like me that has a lot of things to do and sort through on their own homemaking is pretty much on your own even if you have a family around you most of you are going to do your work by yourself so that's why I enjoy listening to something that's why I'm leaving this here for you to listen to and if you don't like it you can go to one of those audiobooks online look for the um, look for the ones that I recommend and her friends this Sally Britton has a list of her friends who also write these audiobooks they have someone else narrate them or read them but they are very good. They're actually very good writers. So I wrote some things down to uh, to talk about today. And first of all, if you're probably going to get tired of hearing this, but if you're not dressed yet and you're not ready, go and get your bath and start getting ready. And maybe even take me with you and listen while you get started, while you get yourself pulled together. And today I had a hard time getting here. I wanted, I had a, a little script here and I wanted to do it. I thought about it a lot, but I just couldn't seem to get up the courage and enthusiasm to do it. So I decided to get dressed up. So I'm dressed up for you today and just did a little extra just because I decided it would be a special occasion to come here. And so I'm going to tell you about the uh, book I'm listening to but first I want to encourage you to do your best and get dressed. I've just been taking things out of my closet that I used to wear in more formal places like when I had to go somewhere or attend something which I'm not doing so much anymore so I thought why just let these things hang there waiting for a special occasion. Every day is a special occasion and here's my saying every day is the Lord's Day and while we do maybe present ourselves a little more formal for church I believe every day is like a church day every day is a special day we should dress our children up every day in some nice way and if you'll notice if those of you who are who have children I noticed when mine were little they once they had worn uh, something nice to church they wanted to wear it the next day and the next day and the next day and I went ahead and let them because they grow so fast that they those clothes wouldn't be available anyway so if they wanted to wear them the next day I let them if they if they felt better and it made them happy I, w- I went ahead and let them wear them and there wasn't anything uh, like your best or your Sunday best because I knew that there wouldn't be any point in saving it and your Sunday best unfortunately 
uh, goes out of style and then uh, you've saved it and it's hanging there in the closet and until you want a new Sunday vest. So wear your stuff. Uh, that's my advice. Wear your stuff. And I'm wearing this uh, this really pretty paisley printed suit that I got from a catalog many years ago. It must have been 20 years ago. I thought I'm just going to wear it. And I can put an apron over it. And that's what I advise all of you to do. You can go online and find good aprons. Walmart has aprons. And some of your local stores will have aprons. So Aprons really made a nice comeback back in the 80s and uh, have been going strong ever since. So this lady that write that wrote the book that wrote the um, that put the audio book online called Letters for Phoebe that I finally finished listening to yesterday uh, had several interesting words and she did a very good job really. Uh, she was true to the Jane Austen style and did a very good job. In fact, her characters were reading books written by Jane Austen and they lived in the Jane Austen era. So I thought that was quite clever. And she was talking about uh, one lady that wanted to meet uh, uh, another lady that she didn't know very well, but she was trying to figure out how she could get there or arrange some kind of meeting and I had talked to you before about the the Regency era custom of not just walking up to someone and introducing yourself that was just considered just totally out of out of place and uncalled for and and not not good manners and it was considered rude and so you had to have someone with you to introduce yourself introduce you to someone else and she wanted to get to know this person but the quote I got was their family how to do it was the question their family circle did not overlap enough to allow accidental meeting <laughs> so like they wouldn't uh, see each other and so she was trying to figure out how to how to get to know someone or meet someone and so I thought that was interesting also also other words and things that I thought were familiar was dotage and d-o-t-a-g-e they don't use that anymore it just means in your old age the word age is in there you know getting in your old older years dotage we prefer to be vital don't we uh, and then the other one was she had a chapter in this book letters for Phoebe called botheration <laughs> Why isn't that a word still? And uh, it was an expression and also a description, botheration. You know, you're bothered by somebody or something has bothered you. Botheration, that's a brilliant word. I love it. I think we ought to bring it back. And the other word was hack, which was apparently a... Um, a carriage and a horse or some kind of like a taxi uh, that was a carriage and a horse and uh, the young man was looking for one that uh, showed signs of wear because he believed in giving his business to people who needed it and who were poorer so he was looking for one to travel and take him somewhere and he was going to give it to the most deserving one apparently the other thing was that I came across was this word perfect because today people use it in such a different way and back in the old New Testament talked about perfect be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect well what it really means is uh, be complete and balanced and that's why uh, when I come here I like to emphasize different things like your good physical rest and I liked Brian Kozlowski's book because he gave kind of a balanced health plan of the Regency era, which was enough social life, enough quiet time, enough uh, rest and sleep. And often went they went to sleep after 6 o'clock. I mean, it was very early. And their last meal may have been 4 o'clock. And, and I actually have been trying that to see if I see if I can heal some of my skin. I have... Uh, some skin problems and and I think that it's improving 
because I'm trying that. Uh, the only thing is getting other people used to the fact that you're not going to answer the door after <laughs> six o'clock and or stay up with people that want to stay up late in the living room, um, getting them used to it. And I think uh, my I think that I have less anxiety and I also think that my creativity has improved a little bit. I'm still experimenting though. I'm a scientist, you know, and I'm my own experiment. So I'm trying that. I did read that to you not long ago from Brian Kozlowski's book, The Jane Austen Diet, where he talked about how they did not actually stay up late at night. And in the movies, of course, they depict these dances and lights and chandeliers all lit up and people dancing, but he said they wouldn't have gone home in the dark they would have gone home just before and been home safe in the night. And so with this word perfect, uh, that has something we have to deal with because uh, many of us who were the oldest in our families, we wanted to be perfect. We wanted our uh, everything we did to be perfect. And it was extremely disappointing when, when life wouldn't cooperate with that, you know, when you couldn't, when you couldn't be perfect. And um, that's one reason I'm enjoying reading uh, Elizabeth, uh, Miss Elizabeth Prentice's book, uh, Stepping Heavenward, which was a diary of a young girl around, about 16 years old. And, and this next year, I'm going to identify as a 16-year-old. I'm going to go through this and see if I can recall what these feelings were uh, from this girl. And so I've also been going through... Uh, and trying to understand anxiety that people express they get anxiety at night or they get anxiety towards the evening. And so because of that, I studied a book called The Weather Book by Eric Sloan. And I want to read you a portion of that. And a lot of it, the anxiety comes from our ignorance because we don't know what what's happening when we feel a little bit eerie or as soon as the sun goes down, there's a depressive depressing feeling and he explains all this weather pressure and also I read a book years ago about uh, the 1800s and it was from this it was a book from this northwest area where I live that talked about their social life people's social life was in the winter because they weren't doing their crops and they weren't uh, doing the things they could do in summer and so their winter life was was their social life so they'd be invited back and forth even in bad weather and that kept their spirits up that kept their mood high and uh, but now many people are alone and so I began to read about anxiety and found some very interesting breathing exercises for anxiety and and other exercises so what I would suggest you do if you suffer from anxiety the trouble with anxiety is though it won't let you stop and read <laughs> what to do about anxiety it won't let you it won't let you try to uh, help yourself <laughs> you're too anxious you can't read uh, you can't bother to read it it's just your mind is uh, racing so bad so this is called and I'll give you the link and what I would suggest you do because most people that are under a bit of anxiety um, can't concentrate or focus on reading something or following something so what you need to do is get someone to read this to you wouldn't that be nice if you could get to you might be able to find an audiobook that has stuff like this in here okay so this is called uh, eight breathing exercises to try when you feel anxious so you can have somebody read it to you while you do it because it tells you what to do it says first do this and then do that and it's the same with other types of exercises like the poses they recommend on this particular site you, you can't read uh, the first step while you do it you could, you'd have to hold your phone or something so you have somebody read it to you wouldn't that be nice so I'm just gonna read to you the breathing exercise okay so I'll just read what, and I'll leave you a link so you can go and read it yourself uh, if you're not too anxious. Um, if you feel breathless due to anxiety, there are breathing techniques you can try to alleviate symptoms and start feeling better. Now, what would this have to do with homemaking? Because this is what this is. This is all about home living. It is easy to get anxiety at home because everything is up to you everything is a do-it-yourself there are there's no uh, support there's no emotional support for it 
you have to make yourself uh, self-motivated and you have to have a great purpose for it and a great feeling of satisfaction and turn it into kind of an art and uh, you have to enjoy it and uh, it's so different than having uh, going into an institution uh, to work or going to a, an institutional school to work to be a student where everything's laid out for you mapped out for you and all you have to do is please the uh, teacher or please the employer and you're done and then you go home whereas home is a totally different setup and so some people realize that uh, while they were at work many people are retiring now and a lot of women are saying that while they were at work they didn't realize how much they had missed at home you miss uh, this the atmosphere of the home you miss the way the afternoon comes on and the sun comes in the windows and you miss you just miss a lot that could be done so to to uh, put a, a stop on anxiety let's let's do this so if you feel breathless due to anxiety there are breathing techniques you can try to alleviate symptoms and start feeling better let's look at several you can do on any point during your day or build into longer moments for yourself. So this is why you need someone to read it, to read it to you because if you are under if you feel any anxiety like towards evening and I'll read to you about the uh, the weather conditions and the uh, the vapor how it comes up and how uh, different sounds will be heard in a, just a different atmosphere as as the sun changes and so lengthen your exile exhale lengthen your exile yeah <laughs> sometimes you do feel it in exile don't you uh, first lengthen your exhale okay so number one let me tell you why here I'll read it inhaling deeply may not always calm you down did you ever over the years those of you who are vital remember people saying well, calm down just take a deep breath you know and uh, that does not work for everybody um, inhaling deeply may not always calm you down taking a deep breath in it in is actually linked to the sympathetic nervous system which controls the fight or flight response but exhaling is linked to the nervous system which influences our body's ability to relax and calm down Taking too many deep breaths too quickly can actually cause you to hyperventilate. Hyperventilation decreases the amount of oxygen-rich blood that flows to your brain. That's one of the reasons that I uh, objected to face coverings. It's just not, not natural. It's not right. When we feel anxious or under stress, it's easier to breathe too much and end up hyperventilating even if we're trying to do the opposite. And you can get a, a chest pain, which isn't anything to do with heart or heart attack, uh, from improper breathing. Before you take a big, deep breath, try a thorough exhale instead. Push all the air out of your lungs, then simply let your lungs do their work inhaling air. Now, you will have to have someone read this to you while you do these exercises because this is number one and then number two next try spending a little bit longer exhaling than you do inhaling for example try inhaling for four seconds then exhale for six do this two to five for two to five minutes this technique can be done in any position that's comfortable for you including standing sitting or lying down isn't that nice uh, I, I hate getting on the floor for exercises. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get back up. So abdomen breathing. Breathing from your diaphragm, the muscle that sits just beneath your lungs, can help reduce the amount of work your body needs to do in order to breathe. To learn how to breathe from your diaphragm, number one, <clears throat> put one hand under your rib cage and one hand over your heart. Inhale and exhale through your nose, noticing how or if your stomach and chest move as you breathe. The idea I think they tell you all the time is that your stomach starts moving and your chest doesn't. So you put one hand on your chest and one hand on your tummy and you breathe like a baby. You observe uh, children when they're asleep, their stomachs move. 
Eventually, you want your stomach to move as you breathe instead of your chest. Practice belly breathing. Okay, number one. This is where you still need someone to, to sit there and read this to you and let you do it. You could call your daughter on the phone and have her read it to you while you do it. Sit or lie down as described above. Place one hand on your chest and one hand on your stomach above, above your belly button. Breathe in through your nose, noticing your stomach rise. Your chest should remain relatively still. That's quite uh, an effort if you haven't been breathing, if you've been tense or anxious for most of your life. I imagine a lot of people just uh, grew up tense. And so uh, this, the system that we are put through sometimes just gives us eternal anxiety, but that should not be, uh, that's not natural. So, and it says here, breathe through your nose, noticing your stomach rise. Your chest should remain relatively still. Purse your lips and exhale through your mouth. Try engaging your stomach muscles to push air out at the end of the breath. For this type of breathing to become automatic, you'll need to practice it daily. Try doing the exercise three or four times a day for up to 10 minutes. If you haven't been using your diaphragm to breathe, you might have to go search and see what where the diaphragm is and what it is, and that's one of your assignments. Um, you may feel tired at first. It gets easier with practice, though. And I find that in homemaking, one of the sources of anxiety is the great amount of responsibility. You have to, uh, like Helen Andelin said in her book, you're going to have to categorize it according to most important things. Uh, the, uh, the food preparation, uh, uh, care of the family, and and not all the other things we'd rather do. But I think most of the anxiety comes from looking at something that needs to be done. And all of a sudden, you get that fight or flight feeling. And and your chest constricts, and then you're breathing up here, and then it starts to hurt, and you're starting to think about that. But I have noticed that once one of my least favorite things to do is to do uh, banking work on the web, you know, going and seeing... Uh, uh, going and seeing about, you know, keeping track of yourself and your spending and uh, paying bills. That uh, gives me, makes me tighten up here in the anxiety. But once I get into it, once I just make myself do the first step, it starts to dissipate. So it's the same with anything you see in your home. A laundry room that most of us complain about are laundry rooms that have gotten, they're always overwhelming is to go and take the first step, do the first thing, and as you move, is that movement uh, releases some of the anxiety. That's what, of course, exercise is all about, isn't it? Breath focused. So this is number three. This is the third exercise. When deep breathing is focused and slow, it can reduce anxiety. You can do this technique by sitting in a quiet, comfortable location, and then number one, notice how it feels when you inhale and exhale normally. I'm sorry about the buzzing. That's that's one of those strange dryers that buzzes until you go and get it. <laughs> um, mentally, uh, feel the tension in your body that you never noticed. Take a slow, deep breath through your nose. Notice your belly and upper body expanding. Exhale, breathe out in whatever way is most comfortable for you, si sighing if you wish. This is why a lot of people do sigh. They're just breathing out. <sighs> They're just breathing out. It's just natural. And I suppose we've chastised our children when they were growing up. Why do you, don't sigh, don't make that noise. Another thing that I noticed that is very important for all of us is to pace, to walk through our house and to pace. But how many times were we told when we were younger, you're pacing again, go and sit down and do something, or go and settle down and do something. But the pacing is very good for us, very important, especially in winter when you can't get outside quite so much. Um, so, then there's equal breathing. I'm not going to read it all to you, or maybe I will, equal breathing. This is the last one. 
Shut your eyes and pay attention to the way you normally breathe for several breaths. Then slowly count one, two, three, four as you inhale through your nose. Exhale for the same four second count. As you inhale and exhale, be mindful of your the feelings of fullness and emptiness in your lungs. Okay, ladies, that's just, I'm going to leave you the link for that if you wanted to try that for those of you who suffer from anxiety. But there are also anxiety, what they call poses, uh, ways ways to stand and uh, hold your arms and your feet uh, that they have uh, found out helps your feelings of anxiety and the tenseness in your upper back and lower back. So these are important and if I were to have you all come to a homemaking session early in the morning and then send you home you know to do your work uh, this is what we would start out with is a few of these um, poses and stretches and and breathing uh, okay and then I'll say now go to it <laughs> so we've got dressed we've got ourselves all dressed and I dressed up special for you today we got dressed and you're doing it a lot for yourself because it's very motivating uh, get dressed up we always want to uh, look younger and smarter but <laughs> That doesn't help. That doesn't happen. But you can put on something nice, and uh, it's easier to change your clothes, isn't it, than to uh, change everything else. But I do believe that in doing some of these breathing exercises and the poses that they recommended on this health Healthline site. Now it's not all perfect. It is not a Christian site, uh, and you're not going to be hearing from the apostle <laughs> when you. So what you do is you just look for what works, what is uh, sound, you know, what is good in it, and try to use those as best you can. And it's the same with anything that you're learning. So the other thing that I would like to recommend about um, solving anxiety. If you get to be where the jobs and the work and the anxiety piles up because of it, because it's you're behind in a lot of things, or you're some things are not where you want to want them to be, and some rooms are not how you want them to be, and you feel rushed, is to eliminate anything that is not directly related to taking care of yourself and your family in your house and taking care of your house so that would mean for a little while you might have to forego or not go to uh, things that social things and other things so what I have done when I've gotten far behind I realize I just can't seem to catch up I'm going to have to eliminate some things as I quit going to a lot of things and uh, for example there were some uh, social activities that I was invited to but I feel, felt like there were enough people already going that I would not be sorely missed. And so I said, you know, I, I'm going to have to, I can't go. And uh, then other things is are things like essential shopping. If I can, I'll send someone else in the family to get it for me. And uh, because you can lose quite a bit of time out of your day uh, even if it's within walking distance of where you live when you have to go get things and when I do go out to get things I try to get more than I need so that I won't have to go again but of course a lot of people are limited in money and they can't do that so in basically when you get too much anxiety in the home because of the jobs that have to be done that the best thing to do is to stay home and do it you can always go for a walk outside around your house or walk in your house you can always get out but uh, basically stay close to home and work on it and cut out all the extra things that you think you have to do sometimes I'll run out of a uh, thread or something and I'll be sewing it something but I don't want to get in the car and go find what I want so I'll figure out a way to order it online or I will find the wrong color thread and use that and I've made a style out of it <laughs> and I'll just put use whatever I have and imagine what would happen if I were way back in a cabin in the woods and there was no way for me to even get 
order thread, what would I do if I desperately wanted to finish sewing that whatever it was I was sewing, I would just use what I had. And I, I really appreciate my little granddaughter because she wanted to sew so bad and she didn't care if the thread didn't go with whatever she was sewing. She just wanted to sew. And so I thought, and she made some very nice clothes for herself. And of course she's homeschooled, so she's not gonna go out and get any kind of peer pressure over it. She's just happy, you know, to have clothes for home and for church. And uh, I have to admire her because she would just put it together the best she can. And so I, uh, you can eliminate a lot of anxiety by not trying to be the world's, uh, per the world's perception of perfection. And because uh, perfection just means, perfect just means to be balanced and to be complete like a circle. And, uh, you know, to be, it's when the Bible talks about be perfect, it's talking about your character. It's talking about your kindness and your goodness, and it's talking about honesty, and it's talking about um, being close to God, and it's talking about a lot of things to be, be balanced in all these spiritual things is what it's talking about. Okay, so now, ladies, you've got dressed, and you've probably done a few things in your home, and done a bit of housework, so... I'm going to read just a paragraph from Eric Sloan's weather book because it will help you understand the atmosphere of the home. And remember the poem we read last time about the uh, the furniture, that, the tables and chairs that, that make a cracking noise. Back in the day when we had wood, uh, most people had wood furniture, you could hear these pops and cracks. And I hear them outside sometimes and realize they were, they're the trees sometimes will pop when the weather changes. And so once I learned a lot about the weather, and this, this page, page four of Eric Sloan's weather book, which uh, was a homeschool book for many children. It wasn't created for homeschool, but people discovered that his writings on weather were great for homeschool. And many of our homeschool books back in the 80s weren't part of a curriculum. They just, we'd go to a bookstore, we'd find something that, that works for us, uh, things, something we wanted to know about. And so, this even has the woolly bear. Uh, remember the woolly bear race in um, the movie uh, Love Finds You in Charm? And they had a, one of those winter or end of the summer fairs uh, where all the jams and jellies were displayed and, and uh, where they had activities and things like that. Uh, the county fair, I think it's called. And they had the woolly bear race. and. Uh, it showed a picture of the woolly bear when its band is wide uh, or has a brown band and it says that it will be a mild winter if the middle of the woolly bear, it's a, like a caterpillar, uh, is, is light, is light colored and the ends are brown. It's very interesting. Uh, okay, so many of the weather sayings that have survived the years those of the deceptive groundhog have never for a moment been accepted by men whose reason demands an adequate cause for every effect. But there are other weather sayings which remain always true. In the course of modern living, man has lost much of his weather, live, weather wisdom. This is so true. We automatically, when we're younger, can tell uh, what a cloud looks like and how different they are and somebody will tell you uh, what, what kind of cloud is a rain cloud and then uh, the media took over this wonderful aspect of of the earth and of life uh, called the weather and so everybody's glued into the weather report and they don't really they don't really feel it the same way they're just reporting something on paper that's been delivered to them off of a wire so it says, what with air conditioning and improved travel facilities, we seem to go where we want and do what we wish, regardless of the weather. Now, homemakers, you're going to be home in good weather and bad weather, but it's always good to, to be able to discern it and understand it so that you don't become anxious, so you don't get any kind of anxiety from it. Once you understand it, you can do things the, uh, that will help with the anxiety. You can say, okay, I know this kind of weather is coming 
or this kind of atmosphere is going to come at, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, so I'm going to save something special and kind of uh, to celebrate with or, or some activity that I'd like to do that I enjoy for that hour so that I don't notice it so much. And this is one thing that I have mentioned to you before that those of you who have worked outside the home or been in schools and colleges don't notice any of this because every hour is planned, um, the the weather is blocked out, you're inside of a building and everything's artificial and you don't notice it. So when you come home, maybe you might notice something is different and not quite understand it. And that's why I recommend this weather book. It's called Eric Sloan's Weather Book. I'll try to remember to leave a link for you. I've read it before to you here. Um, uh, except for an occasional rained out ball game or called off sailing trip or postponed air flight, we presume that weather has very little influence on us. Isn't that sad? And uh, we are made, and even in, uh, in religious circles like uh, the church or Bible study, we often don't notice that we block out the very things that God gave us and weather is one of them and he said we presume that uh, the weather has very little influence on us and so we don't notice it but even in the church everything is spiritual and we're not taught too much about you know this God-given weather but that's the beauty of homeschooling. You can do a lot of things you're not, you can teach a lot of things and learn a lot of things that you don't learn at church. And you should never depend on the church to give you all the information you need about home living or about um, homeschooling um, because you can do so much at home and so, or health, anything like that. Um, it says, it has far more influence on us than is immediately apparent. We live it, breathe it, the weather. We actually swim uh, through an atmospheric sea from room to room. Yes, from place to place. The slightest difference in the composition of this sea would change our way of living within a fraction of a second. No developments in our technological age can alter the fact that we are creatures of this atmosphere. Well, you know, I recently had a window. Uh, descendants came and uh, replaced an old window. The window was 60 years old and it was real thin. And I thought that the window is the soul of the house because immediately the atmosphere in that room changed because of that beautiful window. And... So if that can change the light and change the window, then you have to know that every moment of the day there's an atmosphere. And if you learn to understand it, that sometimes the anxiety will dissipate a little bit. Now, I was reading last time from uh, Helen Andelin's book. She had a really good chapter on homemaking, and I had read that to you also and uh, she had written a book called the fascinating girl now some of it not all of it is would be something everyone would like uh, it wouldn't be applicable to every everything but I had read I had read to you about self-dignity and and also how uh, important I think I might have read about forgiveness to you and one of the things that stood out to me in this way about so did, about forgiveness that she had mentioned and I won't be reading it but that uh, some people develop such bitterness over forgiveness that they actually make themselves sick and um, she mentioned that some people have died because of it and what I found a great remedy for for forgiveness uh, it's very hard sometimes if you have been treated extremely unfairly and undeservedly uh, is to forgive them but it doesn't mean that they are right it doesn't mean that they are um, excused and it doesn't mean that they're not guilty it just means you're free and then you let it, the chips fall where they may and see what happens and you will find uh, many times that people who have been unfair to you or unkind to you or have cheated you eventually 
uh, eventually will suffer for it. Eventually, you just wait and watch, and uh, it'll take care of itself. And uh, and you may end up doing well in life, or prospering, or in some way doing so much better. I also yesterday, last time I talked to you, read to you uh, about tea with Jane Austen by Kim Wilson. And it might seem like I'm doing a lot of Jane Austen. I really have been. Because it is uh, something that I can talk about that has character in it that without having to talk about a real person. And uh, you have to be so careful with that, especially when you're broadcasting to others. So uh, her fiction often covered characters that we have today and I often run into something that I'm thinking that that was so crazy I'm gonna have to write that in my novel <laughs> I don't have a novel but uh, so I wanted to read to you uh, a section of this book by Kim Wilson called Tea with Jane Austen and it's called a delectable assortment of treats. Now, besides reducing anxiety through your breathing and through stretching and poses, which I'm going to give you links for, uh, there's tea. And you can always find, uh, go do a search and find out what teas are the best for anxiety. And you'll find out there are a lot of things right in your kitchen cabinet your, some of your herbs and spices that you use on your foods make good teas and also other teas that are available. Uh, one of the most recommended one was lemon balm. Most people have lemon balm growing outside around their house somewhere or in their gardens. Um, and it doesn't have any color to it. When you make it you think, oh this doesn't look like a tea. But it is supposed to be very calming. A delectable assortment of treats. Owners of elegant shops, especially those such as dressmakers and milliners, who who catered to women, often offered tea to their customers. Now, wouldn't that be nice to go into a shop that had all the things you needed over in this section, and maybe you could buy a pair of boots or shoes over here, or you'd ha or you'd get to buy a, a new brush over here. But somewhere in there is a place to sit down after shopping and have a cup of tea. <laughs> But that's why we do that's why we have tea rooms in our own houses, isn't it? I've got a little tea table in nearly every room now. Uh just a tiny little round table. It is very probable that Jane Austen and I, I really do think when I think of uh, this idea of you know, a place to have tea in the shop, how inconvenient that would be for the um proprietors because you know you have to pay somebody to clean it up you have to pay somebody to serve it and it, it wouldn't be um, it wouldn't be pleasant for them but it sure be pleasant for the customers it's very probable that Jane Austen was offered tea when she went to such an establishment as Miss Hare's her milliner in London to order a pretty new cap or to Mrs. Tickers whose young assistant informed Jane to her high amusement that Where am I? I'm lost. Tea contributed to the genteel atmosphere of the transaction and paved the way the shopkeeper hoped to a pleasant and profitable relationship with the customers. Now this is the first time I ever saw a, uh, a relationship with the customers reference. And this is the big difference between before this uh, big uh, sh quote shutdown and after. Is before it was very important to the proprietors to have the customers happy and have a happy experience in the stores, and they wouldn't allow any disturbance in the stores. And they always tried to make the co customer comfortable because the customer was their living. That if they would spend money, and and spend more than they wanted to even. Uh, they they would be employed. The uh, the one that owned the shop would be employed. They'd be, be able to employ people. And most people knew that the customer was their employment and that they couldn't be rude to the customer because that was their bread and butter. That was their um, 
that was their salary. And if they ran off a customer or they were rude to a customer, they were losing quite a bit of money and they could lose their job because there wouldn't be money to pay for it. Well, this connection was somehow lost during this uh, shutdown and then this reopening of the shops and you go in and now there you felt like you were in a, uh, a gulag you felt like you were in a prison camp you go in and they would make you walk down a certain way and come back up another way you couldn't go uh, up and down an aisle you had to go only up and then down another way it was just uh, excruciatingly painful to figure that out handle your children that who were with you um, and get your things and get out of there it was so stressful and uh, they forgot, I don't know if they forgot or somehow overlooked the fact that in obeying these tyrants and making us stand on an X and making us uh, stand back a certain amount of, one store as I recall made you stand back uh, a couple of feet uh, and then put your money down or your debit card out and you could stand up a little stand closer but then they make you stick stand right back right after you're finished with that transaction and um, they had it all memorized and it just sounded like a dance you know uh, come forward uh, okay put your card in put your money down uh, okay stand back and it was just uh, these these uh, employees had to memorize all this stuff and it was just so crazy and they forgot about the uh, customer <laughs> that they were human beings that had feelings and if they didn't have a good experience they weren't coming back and a lot of the stores did not recover afterwards uh, because of the way that the customer was treated and so here when I read about this uh, tea being served in a store it's, it's quite interesting tea contributed to the genteel atmosphere of the transaction and paved the way the shopkeeper hoped to a pleasant and profitable relationship with the customer. Relationship with the customer was what it was all about back in the day. Even in our day, as fast fading it seems. If, on the other hand, Jane went shopping for a bargain, as she often did, to a shop such as Grafton House, where the whole, whole counter was thronged, and we waited full half an hour before we could be attended to. She perched on the high stools at the counter, made her choices as quickly as she could, and got out. At such a shop, Jane may have got her penny worth for her penny, as Mary Crawford says in Mansfield Park, but it was extremely unlikely that she was offered tea. And so the book goes on to talk about the other shops that would have had tea. So here's one uh, where you could be one shop in her day, it says. And of course, she could always have a refreshing cup of tea. In her letters, Jane Austen, Austen mentions a cousin of hers drinking tea with a lady at a pastry cook's shop. And certainly a strawberry ice followed by a steaming pot of tea would be the very thing to polish off a long day's shopping. Now, I wanted to finish off my broadcast today with uh, with a little bit out of Wives and Daughters since I had not read there for a while and it's Mrs. Uh, it's Hyacinth who is the widow who is going to marry Molly's father Mr. Gibson and uh, she has met Molly and she wants to welcome her and she says uh, she says uh, Mr. Hamley that Mr. not Mr. Hamley but Mr. Gibson really loves her and that all he does is talk about her how much he adores her and and so I have uh, marked a few pages that I want to read about, but I wanted to bring that out because when they when they got married and two families got together, they always were very aware of the fact that you didn't just marry this one person and it wasn't all about you and him or him and her because 
it involved a whole lot of other people and it affected other people. I was talking to a friend of mine on the phone and I asked her why she liked Jane Austen and she said because the stories indicated that that people had to be careful who they married because it uh, affected future generations and she said we don't think about that much today and she said it also had something to do with previous generations and how it would make your family story look and all these things and she said Jane Austen was also the first one that she'd ever read that brought out uh, manners really good manners and the manners especially of of being uh, you know kind and introdu being introduced to people and the things that have been kind of forgotten today even though we have a kind of protocol today and so now I'm going to finish off by reading uh, Stepping Heavenward the 16 year old girl's diary and so I am at January 30 and it was written in 1831 I think it's a year or two worth and so my granddaughter and I were going to start writing to each other so that we can put it in a little book for each other someday and we're going to write polite letters to each other to see how that works out and and talk to each other about uh, our deepest desires and um, ambitions so uh, maybe I'll uh, amount to something someday <laughs> if I talk to her long enough she does so many things so January 30 and it's uh, the lady that's writing is Catherine I'll read to you the introduction here back here some of you. Stepping Heavenward by Elizabeth Prentice, first published in 1869, tells the story of Kate and her quest to live a better life. Doesn't that sound like a typical 15, 16 year olds? We just wanted to do everything so perfectly. Tells the story, and by watching her godly mother, with whom she becomes irritated at times, Kate learns about striving for excellence, a no nonsense approach to Christian living. Stepping heavenward employs good humor, all the while leading the reader to ponder deeper eternal matters. The diary of Kate reveals innocence coupled with an acute awareness of her natural human tendencies to selfishness. Through stepping heavenward, we learn that small things really do matter as Kate matures into a young woman with true depth of character. While Kate's freckled face candor is truly refreshing, the artfully penned expressions woven throughout Stepping Heavenward also provide great reading. I sure wish I had had this when I was very young. I could have read this at 12 and understood it, and and it would have been so helpful. But, you know, even though I homeschooled my children, I'm homeschooling you, I did go to public school, and I see what harm it did me. I'm always catching something. I'm always being made aware of something that I either missed out on or that I thought wrongly about because of faulty teaching or left out, things left out. Uh, for instance, character was totally left out. Once in a while we'd pick up some of it by reading a, a book about uh, the presidents, the president's wives, or kings and queens, or something like that, and and we would pick up a little bit of it, but not quite realize what it was, and uh, so so it it was quite shallow. And I wish that I had had this. My life would have had a lot more meaning from the age of twelve and on up. And it says. There is humor, seriousness, and some sadness as Kate progresses through the stages of life. Through it all, author Elizabeth Prentice displays an astounding ability to put the struggles faced by all men and women who desire to live for Christ, yet are confronted by their flawed humanity, into words. It's an elevating, interesting book that both mothers and daughters will enjoy. Now, you have to understand it. It starts out at first I was a little put off by it because it starts out with the fir girl's first entry at how upset she was with her mother because her mother had encouraged her not to be conceited and had to explain to her what conceit was. Sometimes we just don't know, do we? And we don't know how others uh, perceive us. And after reading that for about a week, I walked around thinking, wait a minute, am I coming across, you know, 
as conceited because I said this or did this. Most of the words from our mouth are what cause us trouble. Not so much our actions, but our words. And that's why I quoted you that scripture from David, put a seal upon my lips, and um, encouraged you to, to say less and do more. Here I am, January 30, and I believe it was 1869, this, this entry to 18, no, 1831. Here I am at my desk once more. There is a fire in my room, and my mother is sitting by it reading. I remember a McGuffey reader entry, uh, entry, one of the early McGuffey readers, uh, when they were still more Christian-like, uh, of the 1800s. And it had a entry in it that said, uh, "Mother is, uh, mother is mending, father is sitting by the fire reading, brother is doing this or that." And I encouraged my children to write something like that in their little notebooks of what everyone was doing one evening, to be aware of what's going on around you, and also to care about the family and write down what all they are doing. And I remember getting letters from grandmothers and great-grandmothers and they would say, uh, uh, Papa is out uh, weeding the garden. I am doing this. I just put up so many cans of fruit and just these little things, but they're so important now to read about. You don't read about, uh, people don't write letters like that anymore. I can't see what the book is that she is reading, but I have no doubt it is Thomas A. Kempis. How she can go on reading it year after year, I cannot imagine. For my part, I like something new, but I must go back to where I left off. That night, when I stopped writing, I hurried to bed as fast as I could, for I felt cold and tired. I remember saying, I am ashamed to pray, and then I began to think of all the things that happened that day, and never knew another thing till the rising bell rang and I found it was morning. I'm sure I did not mean to go to sleep. I think it was now wrong for me to be such a coward as to try to say my prayers in bed because of the cold. Um, I always tell my children to pray uh, when they're sitting or uh, when they're awake and not in bed because they'll fall asleep while they're praying. But I guess there's nothing wrong with that. It's better uh, to pray all the time, I suppose, and uh, nothing wrong with that. While I was writing, I did not think once how I felt. Well, I jumped up as soon as I heard the bell, but found I had a dreadful pain in my side and a cough. Susan said I coughed all night. I remembered then that I had just such a cough and just such a pain as the last time I walked in the snow without overshoes. Do you remember the overshoes? They were um, waterproof boots that you put on over your shoes. And they weren't uh, insulated or anything, but they protected your feet from the wet. Not necessarily the cold, but the wet. I crept back to bed feeling about as mean as I could. Mother sent up to know why I did not come down, and I had to own that I was sick. She came up directly looking so anxious, and here I have been shut up ever since. Only today I am sitting up a little. Poor mother has had trouble enough with me. I know I have been cross and unreasonable, and it was my own fault that I was ill. Another time I will do as Mother says. So here's her January 31 entry. How easy it is to make good resolutions, and how easy it is to break them. Now in 1831, uh, they needed to have the same character training as we do today. There's nothing new under the sun. Mankind has not progressed to any kind of perfection. We all need to learn the same things. We all need to learn self-control and to manage our temperament. And uh, this is very good for home life, too, because if you want to, one of the most beautiful things that I experienced in homeschooling was that the family started to be very cohesive, and we started to care how each other felt, and we we were noticing uh, when some people were not considerate, and the difference between being considerate and uh, courteous. And uh, you don't notice that when your family just separates and goes somewhere else under somebody else's authority all day long. You don't, you don't really notice all these little things. And uh, you'll notice that your children will watch every move you make. 
And that's why you have to be good and honest about what you do and think about what you're doing. And um, so just as I had got so far yesterday, Mother spoke for the third time about my exerting myself too much. And just at that moment, I fainted away, and she had a great time all alone there with me. I did not realize how long I had been writing, nor how weak I was. I do wonder if I shall ever, ever really learn that Mother knows more than I do. February 17. It is more than a month since I took that cold, and here I am, shut up in the house. To be sure, the doctor let me go downstairs, but then he won't listen to a word about school. Oh dear, all the girls will be ahead of me. That's one beauty of about, about homeschooling, is because you'll always be in your school when you're home. Uh, <clears throat> This is Sunday, and everybody has gone to church. I thought I ought to make good use of the time while they were gone, so I did some reading. I knelt down and tried to pray, but my mind is full of all sorts of things, and I thought I would wait until I was in a better frame. At noon, I disputed with James about the name of an apple. He was very provoking, and he said he was thankful he had not got such a temper as I had. I cried, and Mother reproved him for teasing me, saying my illness had left my nerves raw. James replied that it had left me where I had, where it had found me, and then I cried a good while lying on the sofa, and then I fell asleep. I don't see I am any better for this Sunday. It has only made me feel unhappy and out of sorts, and I am praying to God to make me better. And so that is the end of that entry, and it just reminds me so much about the family and how we all need to bear one another's burdens and that the the strong ought to um, ought to be strong for the weak bear the uh, burdens of the weak and people aren't deliberately weak trying to be a burden on anybody and and how we had a long discussion about that with my children and uh, so ladies I hope that this has helped you find time to do something and something to think about and if I'm not ever, ever not here, uh, you can go to some of these audiobooks. And if uh, I've told you in the previous video what to look for, and um, listen to some of the audiobooks that I, I have uh, been listening to to help you if you need the noise. Most of you have someone there that that can provide the noise for you. So, ladies, I love you. Thank you for everything you do to me and for your encouragement. It keeps me going. Your comments keep me going. If you don't want to comment directly under on the blog you're welcome to email me with a comment it just tell me it's a comment and i will put it up for you so i'll see you next time stay close to christ bye